So I thought from my talk, I would focus a little bit on some consistency checks one could do when doing experiments. So I, I start with something very simple and maybe obvious, but I say it anyway. So, so here is shown some JV curves. Um, and, and so one thing that you may want to consider, it may sound kind of stupid, but if you read a paper and they give you efficiency and some other values, <clears throat> do multiply it with each other and see whether this is consistent. I have found not only one paper or manuscripts where this was not the case. So this is sort of the most basic uh, consistency check you could do. Then of course, in perovskite, it's very prominent. You should really check for stability because sometimes you have high efficiencies and they last only for some seconds. And then if you report that, it's also nice to start or to do it with absolute efficiencies, not normalized efficiencies. Sometimes you do it, people do it with normalized efficiencies, but then it may happen that the device with 21% actually crosses the one with 17% after 60 seconds. That's also not so useful. And then also something that really happens is that the short circuit current is not totally correct. So one should really also check and report the short circuit current density that you get from the EQE when you integrate the, the convolution with the AM1.5 spectrum. So these are very basic checks, but as I say, uh, as I said, I've seen it not only once in literature um, that this was not <clears throat> complied with. So let me move on to something more complicated, and that um, is the question, is capacitance spectroscopy a good metrics for perovskite solar cells? And for that, I want to start with explaining uh, capacitance a little bit. It's, a, in my experience, a difficult topic, so I, I try to do my best. So I show here a silicon, basically a silicon PN junction based on a silicon wafer. This is where this spectrum technique was actually de uh, developed. And where you have there usually a very highly doped emitter and then a lower doped base. And uh, then you form a PN junction, which means you have a space charge region here. So this is the space charge of the one type and space charge from the other types. And this must balance, so that's a condition. And then you basically only need the Poisson equation that was already mentioned and you can calculate electric field here in the space charge region, the band bending, so you can construct your band diagram and so on. And now if you do a capacitance measurement, what you do is you apply a little bit of a voltage. So you, you, you increase the voltage a little bit from one side to the other side. That what happens then is then your space charge width widens, you get this extra charge, space charge here. And um, now the capacitance is actually simply given by delta Q over delta V. So the charge that comes out here when you change the uh, voltage a little bit. <clears throat> and that is in this most simple picture actually given by the dielectric constant times the area of the device over the depletion width here. And um, so let me go a little bit further into this and I, I magnify now the depletion width here. So here you could actually think of this as a flat plate capacitor in the light. So here's one plate and here's the other plate. And then what is also important to know is there's a simple equation for the depletion width. You can um, calculate from um, this, this depletion approximation. And, um, and from that, since you know that this is the capacitance, you can derive a simple formula for the capacitance um, as, a, as a function of the applied voltage. And it turns out if you plot one over C square versus voltage, then you get this inverse slope <clears throat> of the doping density. So if you do that, here's one over capacitance square over voltage plotted. You should expect this straight line here. And so the inverse slope, one over the slope is the, the acceptor density and you can even get the built-in potential. So that looks very nice. It only works for the most ideal cases actually. So often also it assumes that the doping is constant here in the device. 
uh, so often it will not be, it will vary with spatial location. What you can do is then you, you take the derivative at each point. So I go back at each point of, of this capacitance versus voltage, voltage, you take the derivative and you can again compute a relatively simple formula here. And um, then you can plot this at each point and each point means basically one over the capacitance because that is the depletion region. So it's at, at each voltage, this point here moves and uh, so you get a charge density as a function of this profiling distance. And it would look like, like this. So it sounds like a very nice technique to measure charge density or defect density. Um, in reality, of course, there's some more things to it, but this is the simplified version. So uh, last year, beginning of last year, there came a, a paper out in Science that had some very interesting results. So it's called Resolving Spatial and Energetic Distributions of Trap States in Metal Halide Perovskite Solar Cells. And in that paper, they use capacitance voltage profiling. They start with a measurement on silicon, which I think was a great idea. So it's a proof that, that they can do the measurement well. So it's a crystalline silicon solar cell. And here they show the carrier density over profiling distance. That's what I just showed you on the last plot. That's about two times 10 to the 16. I know that's actually the, the density they have in their, uh, <clears throat> in, in their wafer. Okay, and then they move on to the perovskite and they, they made a very thick crystal. So uh, they do the same measurement. You see here, this is the profiling distance is a millimeter. So, so it's actually a millimeter thick crystal and they plot the trap density. And it's about two times 10 to 11 here. Um, I think this is also very nice measurement. and uh, No issues with that. And it showed that in this, I think you can really show that in this crystal, you have a very low carrier density. Then they showed uh, some thinner crystals. So this one is 40 micrometers thick and also trap density has a similar um, uh, trap density they derived. Now they have this kind of a strange shape here. And um, I got a little worried. And this was a discussion between Thomas Kierkegaard and his group and, and myself. And then they also reported this on the thin film for Ofsky where they showed a trap density of 10 to the 15, um, again, using the same method. And now at this point, uh, we were wondering, okay, we had done some simulations of uh, this charge densities versus profiling density in perovskites and found similar shapes, actually, even without putting any doping into the, into the simulation. So we were kind of worried about this, but um, then if you go, Further along, reading the paper, what they found, they, they, they did actually enormous amount of measurements uh, and also synthesis of, of materials devices, very nice work. And they did, they made all these different crystals with different thickness from 10 to about 40 micrometers. And then they measured the trap density. And you can see now that the thicker the crystal gets, the lower gets the trap density here. And uh, that's really a question, they, that was their conclusion. Now that the trap density or doping density depends on the thickness of the crystal. But if you think about it, uh, it's a little bit hard to understand why that should be. And so what we did then is we took a relatively simple model, the SCAPS 1D drift diffusion model, open source with the perovskite, PARC, PDAA, uh, whole transport layer, PCBM, type uh, electron transport layer. And we simulated the same devices, so the same thicknesses without any doping or defects, no defects, no doping in there. And this is what we got. And you can, I think, immediately see it, it looks identical. It looks completely identical to their measurement results. And that is kind of really surprising in a way and not easy to understand, but um, so we went further into understanding this. And so what we did is we looked at what do you expect for very low doping? So before I showed you a PN junction, it was 
sufficiently enough dope like this. So you have a device that's a device thickness, and then you have the space charge region that's part of the device. And so you can actually, you have a 300 micrometer wafer and a space charge region that is one micrometer. So this is very far away. Now, if you have very low doping, again, this should be sharp charge balance here. I don't show this so well because this would have to be higher, but basically this charge has to balance the one on this side. And so what happens if you have very low doping or no doping, your, your whole device is depleted. And then your capacitor is basically here. Your contacts is forms your capacitor. And then you could already think, so what happens if I change the voltage? Now it gets complicated. Um, the whole measurement becomes kind of complicated. So I show you that in the next slide in zero bias. So if it's, let's assume for now, actually it's okay. So here, this is the depletion width of the device. Now, if I go further in reverse bias, I can, deplete the whole device. So in the case for very low doping, you may even start with this situation. If you increase the bias more, you just deplete it even more, but it, it doesn't change the capacitance. Capacitance change really the same because it's always the, the, basically the flat plate capacitor between the two contacts. Now you could say, okay, let's go in forward bias and I can actually decrease my depletion region. And uh, this is what people have done now, actually, for many years in many materials, um, also charcoal pyrites and thin film silicon and cadmium pyrite and so on. And in, in principle, this is okay. You can see here the depletion region got smaller. Now it's smaller than device thickness. You think, okay, this might be okay. But also, what I've shown here is the quasi Fermi levels. So this is the electron quasi Fermi level, the whole quasi Fermi level. And you can see that. Here for this 0.5 volt forward bias, you, um, you have injection. You have actually now already quite large levels of electrons in the device and holes in the device. So, and, and that's not depletion anymore. So the method is really about depletion capacitance. So let's look at what happens if you have this injection capacitance. So that's, that's shown here. That's actually a simulation also with scaps and forward bias. And, and you can see that you can describe the capacitance and forward bias at some point at least with uh, basically exponential functions, right? It follows the JV curve basically. So you have uh, something like a diode factor in there and, and, and just QV over KT, the exponential of it. And um, now you could say, okay, let's take this capacitance, do this formulas again. I do the derivative and so on as I would do for a normal uh, silicon solar cell. And then what you end up with is this equation here. So you get this CV charge density from CV or parent charge density and a relatively simple equation here. And it basically mostly, it, it only depends on the epsilon and that changes a little bit, not much. And then the square of the depletion width. So if I plot this like this here, it would look like this. So you would expect something like this. This would be the, the, the CV density derived from, from the experiment, from this curve experiment in, in this case. And if you plot it now over the profiling distance, it, it looks like this. Now you may already you may remember from what I showed you before, but I plotted in here. So this is the experiment from the science paper. You can see that this actually perfectly follows this expected shape up to 15 micrometers distance or so. And um, so I thought this looked very convincing. You can, you can do this for all the data in the paper, but also I, I did remember I've done capacitance voltage profiling actually for many, many years and I've seen a lot of data. And I remember that a lot of these data look like this. And so we looked in the literature and plotted these all in one plot so here's shown the charge density, here's the profiling density. So you see amorphous silicon, you see CIGS, you see perovskite, cadmium telluride, CIGS again, perovskite thin film. And they basically all follow this, this shape here. This red one is this, this analytical shape. So this, this um, orange one is, is the simulation. And uh, you can also plot it 
Now double logarithmically, you can see in double logarithmically it will be just slope two or, or one over two. And you can see that it basically it, it explains or it, 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 it's a tension to all this data here. So none of the data drops below that. What does it say? Really? I mean, you already can see that. Is it really true that in no device whatsoever there wouldn't be a lower charge density closer than whatever 0.5 micrometers of the interface? Probably not, right? So uh, to, to further understand that, we can look again what happens here. So here, this is now from the SCAP simulation shown again. This is one over C squared here shown over applied voltage. So here, if it's, it's a device in, in, in depletion, basically, we said very low doping. So here, if you change the bias, it doesn't change much. Capacitance stays, stays the same. And at some point it increases. So one over C squared goes down and then it increases a lot and it goes to zero. Now, uh, if you take uh, this, this derivative formula and plot it versus voltage, it looks like this. Yeah? And now, if instead we plot it over the, the space charge region, it suddenly looks like this here. And, um, and that, that shows you now that this, this is kind of a universal shape you get here, which is on this side is uh, limited by, by the width of your device. So basically here you increase the reverse bias, but nothing happens with the capacitance. And here you have injection of carriers in your device. And you get this artificial shape. And then you have a region here where it, it's maybe okay. And if you look at it, so it, in, and uh, here are different curves shown for different forward and reverse biases used. You can see the, the further you go in reverse bias, the higher up you go here, and the further you go in forward bias, the higher you go, go up here. And this was in the science paper actually interpreted as a different amount of defects at the coal or the, the electron transport layer. And uh, it's, it's all over the literature also for other materials that uh, these increases are interpreted as real charge carrier interface defects and so on. And um, so what we're showing here is that this can be complete. I mean, usually it, it, it is complete artifacts. One has to be very careful about. <clears throat> so uh, I didn't mention, so this is an archive right now, a comment which was supposed to come out last Friday, I think, but maybe tomorrow will come out. Um, Next slide was, so what you can do is now with, a, again, a relatively simple model, you say the capacitance consists of the geometric capacitance and this injection capacitance. And uh, you do the math, you can calculate this minimum CV carrier density that you should be able to measure with, with in, a, in, a, in a device. And you get this equation here and there's not much in there. Actually, it's again, it's the, it's the epsilon and it's the thickness of the absorber by the square. And we have plotted that here. So this is the, the charge density here. And uh, this is the thickness of the device, double logarithmic plot. And so you, the expectation is that this is the region you could access. So here, the charge carrier density is high enough that you can measure it in a given device. So you have, um, a one micron thick device. So the charge carrier density should be above 10 to the 15. And this is the inaccessible um, area. And we plotted um, the data from the science paper in here. And you can see that they just fall all on this minimum line, which shows that um, this even a simple model can actually explain a lot uh, of what's going on here. So this is a caution about using capacitance voltage profiling for getting charge densities in vehicles or charge densities in devices. Um, then a similar issue. So there was um, now uh, two years ago, there was a, a paper in Nature Energy. So this is, I took this from a, from a website. They said, okay, we make now a perovskite PN junction. And by that we significantly now reduce the recombination of the device. And then they measured, they changed the, cut ion ratio and they measured the charge 
the doping density and then the p-type side, they had about 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 or the n-type side, they had 10 to the 10. And now you can, from what I've told you already, you can think about how large is the bleaching region for such low doping densities. Because if you have a PN junction, if you want to have a PN junction, yeah, the bleaching width has to be within the device. And uh, you may guess already, it's, it's way larger than this, this 500 nanometer. It's five microns or something like that. And there was uh, very recently a comment by Thomas Kiergaard and David Kahn, also in Nature Energy, where they show this, that for these carrier densities that they report, it's no way there could be a PN junction in the device. So this is also what I would say is a consistency check. So if charge densities are reported or interpreted as PN junctions and so on, check whether this actually complies with the electrostatics. And um, just one more thing about capacitance. So you can also measure the frequency dependence or temperature dependence of capacitor, capacitance. And the hope is that you get some energetic information um, about defects and, and doping levels in your device. So here's shown the, the capacitance versus frequency for a perovskite device. This is a recent publication actually from last year in, in Joule. And then you get these, these steps and they're usually interpreted as, as defects. So you can take a derivative and it will look like a density of states and so on. Um, so here is called D1 and D2 step. And what they showed in this publication that this step actually completely goes away if you leave off the whole transport layer as shown here. And then they, in this publication, they also show that this step here is mostly is, is really due to ionic motion and so on. And um, so that's another caution you really have to have about the frequency dependence of capacitance. And that reminded me of a discussion we had 10 years ago on CIGS. There people usually recorded at low temperatures the capacitance step here versus frequency. And it was called the N1 step and interpreted as interface defects. And um, there's big discussions about that. And, and at that point, through a detailed study where, where we varied also the contact layers and so on, we could show that this step actually is not due to an interface defect here, but to a back contact barrier that can produce this artificial capacitance step in your capacitance response. So this is also something that can happen. Okay, let's move on now to luminescence. We did publish uh, some kind of a tutorial last year in advanced energy materials and photoluminescent based characterization. It's called progress report, but that's a formal issue. It's really thought as, as more as a, as a tutorial. And it discusses the different aspects of steady state PL and transient PL when you go from the absorber to absorber with contact layer to full devices. And I, and I will talk a little bit about that now here. Um, so there are different types of characterization you can do with the sort of luminescence. So Susanna already talked about it. Um, here is, is a tr your transient photoluminescence. And so sometimes it's correlated with, or often I would say with device performance, AVOC and efficiency. And uh, then there's also the photoluminescence uh, quantum efficiency which is becoming more and more popular. And you can do it either measuring it on the spot or you can do some imaging as shown here. So now if you <clears throat> compare this, so you plot the open circuit voltage versus the minority layer uh, carrier lifetime, or alternatively, this is the photoluminescence quantum efficiency versus the minority carrier lifetime. Um, what we did here, we took a lot of data from literature and, and uh, look whether we could make sense out of it basically. And then you can see, yeah, it scatters. There's some, some sense to it, but, but there are also some problems. So this, here there's some values that are very low. So the question is, is the lifetime here too large or the VOC too small? Here there were some very high quantum efficiency values in the literature, 60% um, or something like that, so huge. And, uh, 
not very large lifetimes actually. So the question is, was the lifetime mesh small or was the PLQY too large? And uh, we discussed that a lot too. That was one motivation also for this tutorial that we went and wrote. So of course there is a, at least an analytical relationship between the VOC and the lifetime and also between the PL quantum efficiency and the lifetime that's shown here. Uh, so from the quantum efficiency, you can measure, you can calculate this non-radiative loss or also the VOC if you want. So Sunny Sintry talked about that. And if you look at the data again, now here you can see, okay, you know, mostly they, they lie on an expected line. There are some variations in the expectation uh, from theory with the doping. So if you have very high doping, then uh, you could have a higher VOC and also here you could have a, a higher quantum efficiency, but uh, so it can explain some, not easily these low values. And also there's some high values here in the literature that are not so easy to, to explain, but, but there can be many reasons for that. I will go into some. So what can be problems with uh, the PL quantum efficiency and the lifetime measurements? So first, uh, again, I think this was mentioned in talks already. So the, the photoluminescence is basically given by this radiative recombination constant times the carrier density. And so this is a gen more general equation that includes high and low injection. And then what you need to know is this delta n, basically. And the delta n is covered by this differential equation. It includes different recombination terms. So Auger radiative recombination, this goes by the cube, by the square, um, by and then the shockley reed hall recombination, and you can have thrift and diffusion, and uh, you also can have photo recycling. <clears throat> and um, so very often the shockley reed hall term dominates, but not necessarily. So here you can also see what happens, so you can have movement of carriers, so the electrons go to the end side, the, the whole to the P side, so you have charge extraction, you can have trapping here, I will talk about that. So there are all kinds of different effects that can happen that make sometimes the TRPL interpretation complicated. But let's start with a still relatively ideal case and look at the injection dependence of the TRPL transients. So that's shown here for the three different excitation densities. So the red one is relatively low, then the higher excitation density and then the even higher excitation density. This is the equation describing the photoluminescence. Now you have to distinguish importantly between two conditions. One is low injection and your delta N is smaller than the P0. That's the case either if the doping is high or you have very, very low excitation conditions. In order to reach them, you need a very sensitive setup. And uh, then, and if you have now <clears throat> shockley reed hall recombination, then basically um, you'll have a mono exponential here with a lifetime as the exponent. If you go in high injection now, so your delta N, your, your, your carrier, photo excited carrier density is larger than the the background doping, then you are proportional to delta n square, and that leads to in the shockley reed hall dominated case that now you see a decay that's going with two times the lifetime. So you measure uh, with actually, um, I, I wrote this wrong. I see this has to be up here, so half the lifetime. So just imagine the two is on top of the um, of the denominator. So what, what this means that your lifetime, if you now, if you would look at here, so you mentioned very low injection is mono exponential. If you go in high injection, still shortly with all non-radiative recombination, this, the recombination is faster because it's high injection. And if you go even higher injection, then the radiative recombination starts to dominate. And uh, this is this case here. So you get a strongly non-exponential curve shape which then allows you also to extract the radiative constant, which can be very useful in many regards. But uh, what this already shows you or what it means is that it's always very good to measure the fluence dependence and to 
specify the carrier injection level at which you measure. Otherwise, it can be very difficult to interpret the data. And um, again, to show you what complicated things can go on. So there's a little busy plot, let me walk you through. Um, shown here is an increase in the excess charge carrier density here. So this will be given or driven by the photo excitation. And up here is the normalized PR intensity. You see the low injection case goes with delta N and then the high injection case goes with delta N square. In this case, one sun conditions were just about here. Now, if you look at the lifetime, it gets more complicated. You have these different contributions. This green curve is the radiative lifetime. It always gets smaller the more carriers you have. Oshie also goes by N to the cube. And then the shockley rid hall lifetime, it's even more complicated because it goes from, say, limited by the, the limited lifetime uh, in, under small conditions, which would be, for instance, the electron capture, the electron recombination lifetime to the sum of electron and hole um, lifetimes. And then if you add these all up, you get the black curve. So you can see it first stays constant and it increases slightly and then it decreases strongly. With excitation. And in the lower plot here is shown the luminescence quantum efficiency. And you can see, let's, let's look at this curve, that it first stays at very low injection, it stays constant, and that it increases, and then it decreases again. This is due then to, to O'Shea recombination. And um, so, yeah, this is what I just said. And this has consequences. So this is shown here now for, for the three different lifetimes, the lower lifetime. So let's see, this is um, 100 nanosecond. This is about a microsecond. This is even larger. Again, here, there's different contributions from different recombination processes. And now for each of these cases, the one sun conditions are shown here in the plots. And here is the external luminescence efficiency shown. You can see here, basically, the lifetime mostly goes down. It first increases a little bit, and then it goes down. And um, here, for the PL quantum efficiency, it first strongly goes up and then goes down. And you can have, if we pick, for instance, um, this case here, you can be at, at around A and 1.5. And if you increase the excitation density a little bit more, the lifetime you measure gets smaller but actually the PL quantum efficiency goes up. So it shows you that it's very important to get the right excitation um, conditions in order to get consistent measurements <clears throat> on, on this. So more things that can uh, be problematic is this trapping issue. So what we did is some, some time ago, we looked at this castorite solar cells, the relation between VOC and the lifetime, and we found this large discrepancy. So here is shown in gray what you would expect from theory or simulation, and these are the data points that were found, the, the castorite and here of the charcopyrite solar cells. The charcopyrite solar cells was mostly okay. So you measure VOCs that are expected from a given, from a measured lifetime, um, and from the simulation, but in Castorite, it did not. So you, you, the measured voltage was way lower. And we looked at this in detail. So here's a typical transient shown. So usually we measure, people measure lifetimes maybe of 10 nanoseconds or so. And what we found to make um, a long story short is that there was a significant effect of trapping and detrapping here. So that the carriers, you photo excite carriers, and then there were falling into traps, into shallow traps. And then it takes time for them to come out thermally. And that depends on the temperature. And it means that if you do a temperature dependent measurement, then this, this lifetime should actually increase a lot if you go down in, in temperature. And you see that for CITS, there's not so much change a little bit, but for castorite, it increases enormously. So at low temperature, you get huge lifetimes. On the other hand, if you go higher in temperature, the, the lifetimes get smaller and smaller. And so from this, we concluded that the actual lifetime was always much smaller than the measured ones. And this, this is also something you really have to watch out for if you, especially if you have discrepancies between 
your measured JV performance or your PLQY and uh, your lifetime. Um, <clears throat> another aspect that of course is important is charge separation in transient photoluminescence and maybe also in, in quantum efficiency measurements. So shown on the left side is, is a simulation taken from this paper from Krogmeyer et al. And and what is shown here is that if you do a transit experiment, then first you get this charge separation. So you have get the electrons going into your, your contact or transport layer, and then they accumulate there, block further charge transfer into the layer, but then have, lead to a very strong interfacial recombination until you, you have some kind of a steady state reached. And if you look at the transients here, this is the PL transient shown over delay time then this depends again very strongly on the excitation conditions for if you lose, use a lot of light then it takes actually a long time you have this charge transfer but uh, it, it, it goes this happens i mean you don't reach a steady state into long times so if you low enough then you have this transfer of charge carriers and then you read um, sorry then you reach the steady state condition of interfacial recombination of that a good way of showing is this if you look at this differential lifetime. So if you take at each point in time, the derivative showing the instantaneous lifetime, you can see here now the interesting case maybe if you manage to have low enough injection conditions, then first you have this, this um, charge transfer, and then you reach this case where it's limited only by interface recombination. And this is the, now the stage where you could infer the, interf the, the lifetime due to interface recombination. And um, if you think about a steady state measurement, PL, quantum efficiency or so, that would correspond to this long time region where you have a steady state, but only if the full device is illuminated. That's something Susanne mentioned. So for that case, you have to make sure you illuminate the whole solar cell and not only a partial solar cell. So in a partial illuminated solar cell, you may have charge transfer effects also in your steady state PL, but if you illuminate the whole solar cell, this is not the case. Okay, so another aspect, of course, is um, we can check for consistency. This is the topic in this talk, um, is if you look at the effects of interface recombination. So there is a very relatively simple equation where you can calculate the lifetime due to interface recombination. If you assume only the interface limits your whole um, recombination in the device. And it's given by this equation here, it's two terms. One term is when diffusion doesn't really play a, long, uh, a role, so the carriers are fast enough in the second diffusion limited term. And here's an overview plot where the layer thickness and the, the surface lifetime is shown. You, sh you can see that only for very thick devices. So this is silicon basically, crystalline silicon diffusion limited plays a role. So we can cross this out and live with this one. And that's really a very simple now term. It's the thickness divided by two times the surface recombination velocity. And with that, you can already conclude a lot of things. So let's say we go now here and, and take a perovskite device with 400 nanometer thickness. This was this, this would be this line here. And we measure a lifetime somewhere, let's say 10 to the minus six, one microsecond. What can you conclude about the surface recombination? So you, you would look basically here, actually you have to look at the color code, but it's more or less identical. So it means that your surface recombination would be 10 to the, um, would be 10 or less, yeah? It cannot be larger than 10. So you cannot conclude with such a measurement that you would have 10 to the three surface recombination. It's not consistent. Same thing, if you think of crane boundaries, it's also a, much discussed topic. So let's say that grains are 100 nanometer thick. So this would be this line here. And now depending on what you measure, if you measure here uh, 10 nanoseconds, if I'm right, and then you look at the color code, okay, then it could be that your grain boundaries have 100 centimeter over second recombination velocity. But if you measure again this microsecond here, 
then your grand bound is basically have, uh, the combination velocity of one, which is very low. So if you measure on a cell or an absorber, actually, I would say, with grain, grain sizes of 100 nanometers, you measure microsecond lifetime, then your, your interface and your, your grain boundary velocity can be not larger than 10, basically. And that's also often I've seen that at times when different measurements were made with different techniques and they concluded about a very, for instance, a very high surface recombination velocity, but then they showed also very long lifetimes and that, that doesn't mix. So that's a consistency check. That's very um, good to do. So that brings me, I think, to the, to the last topic. So how, again, maybe on this topic on distinguishing interface and bark recombination. So we did this study two years ago in different perovskite samples where we varied first look at the perovskite layer on, on class and then with a hole transporting layer and then with electron transport layer and then with both and the whole device. And we measured the, the photoluminescence quantum efficiency in the quasi Fermi level splitting. And uh, then you can see that on the, on the bare absorber, we found this quasi Fermi level splitting and it consecutively decreased with adding these layers to it, which showed the contribution of interface recombination to this. And um, so we also did some lifetime measurements on this. And for the bare film, we found a lifetime of about 500 nanosecond. And for this contacted layers about, so again, this is the charge transfer region here. And this is the interface recombination region about 30 nanoseconds. And if you plot this, on this plot that I showed in the beginning of, of uh, this presentation, say that here could be, actually it should be the quasi Fermi level splitting, not open circuit voltage versus the, the derived, the measured minority carry lifetime, you can see that they actually nicely fall onto this expected theoretical curve. So you, it is possible, it's not always easy, but it is possible to really get a consistent um, data set on this. And um, maybe the last thing I want to mention, because this was a, also a discussion we had with the reviewers of that publication, is what does it mean if you look at the, the VOC? So we did some simulations here, and I'm showing here again, this says VOC, but it should be the quasi Fermi level splitting. And here is shown the interface recombination. So there are different assumed interface recombinations. And these curves here, are different assumed bulk recombination lifetimes. So this one is a very large one, 2.5 microsecond. This is a very small one, 100 nanosecond. And now we can look at the VOC, say of the, the unoptimized device. It was here, here. And then we can read off this plot. We can read off the, the interface recombination. So it was something like 10 to the three. That's what I've shown you up here. And now the question is, does it help? If you have such strong interface recombination, does it help to have a longer lifetime in the bulk? And it shows you here very directly and very clearly. It, it doesn't matter at all. You know, all these curves fall on top of each other. And uh, it would only matter if, you, if the interface recombination is small, let's say um, at least smaller than 100 or at, at 10, then it really helps if you increase um, your bulk lifetime, then it would help your VOC of your device. But um, if your interface recombination is in the 10 to the three range or 10, even with 10 to the two, 10 to the three range, then your, your grade material that you have with, I don't know, five microsecond lifetime doesn't really improve the VOC um, of the device. And you first have to, if you want to increase the, the device, you have to first work on the interfaces. So I think that was my last slide. That's a image from a recent paper on tandems. It's 29% tandems where we did some imaging on it. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention.